Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think we're about ready to start. It's nice to uh, see such uh, a big turnout. I'd like to welcome you all to, uh, to Arundel House. My name is Nigel Inkster. I'm the Director for Future Conflict and Cybersecurity here at uh, IISS, and uh, I will be uh, chairing um, this event. As I think um, all of you are all too well aware, the issue of the South China Sea has uh, achieved um, significant uh, salience um, in, uh, in recent years. Um, a lot has been written about it, including by uh, scholars in IISS. Uh, in 2013, uh, we published an Adelphi uh, book on precisely uh, this topic, and it has been a major uh, issue of discussion at successive uh, Shangri-La dialogues, and I expect that to continue with the forthcoming dialogue that takes place um, in uh, early uh, June this year. Um, I'm not going to rehearse here all of the um, issues um, uh, around um, the competing claims um, to um, assets uh, within the South China Sea. Um, I suspect these are all too well known, and in any case, you haven't come to hear me. You've come to hear uh, our speaker, uh, Ambassador Liu Xiaoming, um, um, uh, a Chinese ambassador to, to the United Kingdom, um, uh, with a very uh, distinguished uh, diplomatic pedigree, having served previously as deputy head of mission in the uh, United States of America, as uh, Chinese ambassador to Egypt and also to the Democratic Republic of uh, North Korea. Um, ambassador Liu uh, has uh, agreed uh, to speak for around uh, half an hour, um, uh, following which uh, there will be uh, time for a question, um, question and answer session, and he's kindly agreed that this whole uh, event, both the talk and the question and answer, will be on the record. Um, if I could just invite you, before, as a courtesy to our speaker, to turn your mobile phones to silent, I will now give the floor to the Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel, for that uh, kind introduction. It is truly delighted to be back at the in International Institute for Strategic Studies after three years. Back then, I was invited by Dr. Chipman to uh, talk about China's diplomacy in the, first, in, in the new era. Today, my speech will also be about China's diplomacy. But this time I will focus on one issue, the South China Sea. Recently, the South China Sea issue has attracted much attention and the media coverage. However, the articles and reporting show that the truth and the facts behind, behind the issue remain unclear to most people. Misunderstandings still exist. So I've chosen to speak about this issue at the I device, a prestigious institution that focuses on international security. I will expound on China's position and policy and then take questions from you. I hope our interaction today will help you to gain more comprehensive understanding of this complicated and difficult issue. In order to be objective, impartial, and rational on the issue of South China Sea, one must get to the root of the issue and put it in perspective. So I'd like to begin with the history of China and the South China Sea. The island and the reefs in South China Sea have long been Chinese territory since ancient times. I emphasize ancient times to highlight the historical facts that put South China Sea firmly 
on the map of China. To elaborate on this, let me share with you the four firsts. China was the first to discover the island in the South China Sea. Some of the countries attempt to claim some of the islands on the ground of prior perception. They try to get away with their illegal occupation by referring the Nainsha Island as a terra nullius. In fact, as early as 200 BC, during China's Han Dynasty, the Chinese had large-scale and frequent seafaring and fishing activities in South China Sea. There's clear evidence that the South China Sea was already used by China as an important shipping route since ancient times. It follows that because of frequent shipping, Chinese became the first to discover the islands in the South China Sea. Marin Samuels is known for his studies on the South China Sea. He wrote a book in 1980s called Contest for the South China Sea. In this book, he wrote, along the way, both literally and figuratively, South China Sea and its islands helped shape the geographical cognita of the Chinese world order. Second, China was the first to name the islands in South China Sea. Today, Nanshan Island of South China Sea is called Spratly uh, uh, in the West. This name comes from British sea captain called Richard Spratly, who thought it was he who discovered and named the island in 1843. But actually, the Chinese had started to name the Nansha Island about 2,000 years, 2, years before he did. In various kinds of Chinese historical records dating back to over 2,000 years, the South China Sea is known as a Zhanghai or Rising Sea, and the islands, reefs, shoals, and sands as a Qitou or Rugged Peaks. In historical documents late of later dynasties, after Han Dynasty, ancient names referring to today's Sisha Island, Nansha Island, and Individual Island in the archipelago are clearly recorded. A popular sailing guide called Geng Lu Bu was compiled by Chinese fishermen. This was during the Ming and the Qing dynasties. Between 14th and 20th century, this book names the dozens of islands of the South China Sea, including those in Nansha, are recorded. Many of these names have been widely adopted and used by international sailors until even this day. Third, China was the first to exercise administrative jurisdiction in the South China Sea. Ever since China's Tang Dynasty, about 1,200 years ago, successive Chinese governments have exercised jurisdiction over the South China Sea. This includes islands and waters around them. The sovereignty was established through administrative establishment, naval patrol, resources development, and management. In the 10th century, during China's Song Dynasty, Local chronicles explicitly recorded that the island in the South China Sea was under the administrative jurisdiction of Qingzhou, which is today's Hainan Island. In 1279, China's famous astronomer Guozhou Qing was recorded traveling to the South China Sea and building a observatorial facilities. The governments of Ming and the Qing dynasties both placed the South China Sea under supervision of a naval patrol. Fourth, China is the first country to develop 
the islands in the South China Sea. For centuries, the Chinese have been engaged in fishing, planting, and other activities on the islands and the nearby waters. The remains of this continuous habitation can be seen through archaeological evidence found on many, many islands. The fact that only Chinese live on Nansha Islands is recorded clearly in a book called The China Sea Pilot, published by the British Navy in 1868. They are fourth mentioned four first, are based on substantial and concrete historical evidence. They testify to the fact that the islands of the South China Sea have long been Chinese territory under successive, peaceful, effective administration. Until 1970s, it was widely recognized by international community that islands in the South China Sea belonged to China. Let me give you two examples. In 1883, Germany sent military vessels to Sisa and Nansha for surveys. The government of Guangdong province protested to the Germans, citing Chinese sovereignty. Germany had to stop the survey and withdrew their team. In 1958, the Chinese government issued a declaration on territorial waters applicable to all Chinese territory, including Sisha, Nansha, and other islands in South China Sea. The Vietnamese then Prime Minister, Pan Men Dong, sent to Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai a diplomatic note which explicitly recognized that Xisha and Nansha belonged to China. I can give you more examples like this, if we have time. History speaks for itself as to who owns those islands in the South China Sea. Then how did the dispute arise? Since 1970s, some countries have tried to lay claim on natural resources in the South China Sea. It was then some nations began to make territorial claims. Vietnam, Vietnam Philippines sent troops and illegally occupied some of the islands. That is how disputes started. Until now, Vietnam has occupied 29 islands, Philippines 8, and Malaysia 5. In 1982, United Nations Conference on the Law of the Seas, or UNCLOS for its short form, was concluded after nine years of hard negotiations. With this development of a maritime legal system in 1980s, countries around the South China Sea gradually made further claims these were based on UNCLOS agreements that include Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ. The EEZ defines continental shelf and other maritime rights and interests. Such overlapping claims in some cases gave rise to disputes of maritime delimitation. This has caused a further complication to the issue of the South China Sea. It is clear that there are two disputes at the center of the South China Sea issue. One is a territorial dispute caused by illegal occupation of Chinese territory. The other is a dispute over maritime delimitation caused by overlapping claims of maritime jurisdiction. These two disputes are intertwined and have made the issue highly complex. However, one thing is clear. Whichever angle one chose to look at this issue, China has never been the troublemaker. Quite opposite, China has been a victim. Now what is China's position and policy? For a long time, China has exercised a high level of self-restraint and forbearance on this issue. 
we have always approached the dispute in a constructive and responsible manner. If China had not maintained self-restraint, the South China Sea would not have been what it is today. I would like to summarize China's position as a five commitments. First, China maintains a strong commitment to peace and stability in the South China Sea. For years, China has been a staunch force safeguarding and maintaining regional peace and stability, building friendship and partnership with neighbors has always been a top priority in China's policy towards neighboring countries. The Chinese people are a peace-loving nation. Moreover, China's development needs a peaceful environment, especially peaceful surrounding environment. In the past three decades, peace and stability has enabled China to industrialize at a speed and scale that is unprecedented in human history. This advance by China can be largely attributed to peaceful and stable environment in its neighborhood and beyond. So China would be the last to wish to see the instability in the South China Sea. It means that China would be the first to oppose conflicts in the South China Sea. Second, China maintains a strong commitment to solving dispute peacefully through friendly consultations and negotiations. The ultimate resolution of territorial disputes, regardless of its mechanism or process, has to be agreed between parties directly involved. The dialogue must be based on negotiations on equal footing if such a resolution is to be fundamental and lasting. Negotiations and consultation are the most effective way of dispute resolution. This is because it can, to a greatest extent, reflect the principle of a sovereign equality and the will and the wishes of the parties involved. Since the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949, we have signed boundary treaties with the 12 of our, four, with the 12 of our 14 neighbors on land. These treaties involved over 20,000 kilometers of boundary. Most of the neighbors are million or small countries, but none of them has ever complained about the approach of China in the negotiations. This examples how China has resolved disputes through face-to-face -face negotiations with other countries directly involved in the dispute. The South China Sea dispute do not need to be an exception. Experience shows that only negotiations and consultations could help the parties concerned to constantly build mutual trust, manage problems, narrow differences, and advance cooperation. Negotiations and consultations are the most realistic and effective approach to the South China Sea issue. Third, China maintains a strong commitment to rule-based dispute management. China and ASEAN countries have concluded declaration on the contact parties in the South China Sea in 2002. And since then, China and ASEAN countries are actively implementing this declaration and now working together on making the code of conduct in the South China Sea, or COC. Since the start of a COC consultation, there has been much progress. China and ASEAN countries have worked actively to set up senior officials hotline platform in response to maritime emergencies and point-to-point -point hotline communication on search and rescue. All sides have also agreed to establish prevent preventive measures to manage risks at the sea, which will serve as an interim measure prior to the final conclusion of the COC. What happened over the years has testified to the effectiveness of this rule-based dispute management. Fourth, 
China maintains a strong commitment to the freedom of navigation and overflight. China is the biggest littoral state in the South China Sea. The vast majority of China's energy supply and trade pass through the South China Sea. This means China cares more than any other nations about freedom of navigation and overflight in the South China Sea. Recently, freedom of navigation has become a hot subject. Some people talk about protecting the freedom of navigation. This creates a dangerous misunderstanding as it implies that the safety and the security of ships passing the region were under immediate threat. The reality is more than 100,000 vessels pass through the South China Sea every year. None of them, none, has ever run into any problem with the freedom of navigation. If there were real threat to maritime traffic in South China Sea, then this would immediately result in a jump in shipping insurance rates. This has not happened. The Reuters news agency reported in January this year there are no signs of commercial shipping being affected in the South China Sea. The report went on to say that the South China Sea area was not listed as a high-risk area by industry's influential Loyster's Joint War Committee. This means insurers do not charge additional premium for vessels operating in the region. Business people, particularly insurers, are the most responsive and sensitive to the risks. Yet they haven't sensed any threat to freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. This makes me wonder what kind of freedom of navigation some people are feeling so eager to protect. The fact is freedom of navigation has been used as an excuse by the United States to flex its military muscles in the South China Sea. The United States sent military jets and warships on closing reconnaissance in the nearby waters and airspace of China's islands and reefs. Such dangerous actions as increased tension and pose a threat to China's sovereignty and security. For example, just 10 days ago, the USS William P. Lawrence, a guided missile destroyer, illegally sailed into the waters near China's Nansha Island. The ship maneuvered without Chinese government permission in sovereign waters of China. Actions such as this, I'm afraid, cannot be regarded as a protection of freedom of navigation. They are the manifestation of a superior military power and assertion of maritime dominance. These actions have posed the big, biggest threat to the real freedom of navigation and peace and stability in the South China Sea. To those who claim that they care about freedom of navigation and overflight, I hope they will act in strict accordance with international law and respect the sovereignty and the security of the coastal states. The actions of the United States should be judged at all times by its approach to international law. If the United States had a serious commitment to maritime law, it would have signed the UNCLOS. China has signed UNCLOS along with most other member countries. Respect for international law and peaceful dialogue on dispute is crucial for the stability and peace in South China Sea. Military provocation and intimidation in the name of freedom of navigation, navigation is highly dangerous. Such actions directly undermine regional peace and stability. Turning to my next commitment point, that's the last point, China maintains strong commitment to win-win cooperation. China values friendly and cooperative relationship with its neighbors. We have taken initiative to call on all parties involved to solve differences 
engage in joint development in the South China Sea. This provides a useful approach to resolution of the issue and is an approach that takes into consideration the interests of all parties concerned. To put it into practice, China has engaged in a serious cooperation initiatives with the relevant countries. In 2005, oil companies from China, Vietnam, and the Philippines signed an agreement for joint marine seismic undertaking in central areas in the South China Sea. This was an effort for joint development of oil and gas resources in the South China Sea. In 2011, China announced the establishment of China ASEAN Maritime Cooperation Fund with a total of 3 billion RMB yuan, or more than 300 million pounds. They were set up to fund maritime cooperation projects. Two years ago, China put forward initiative of 21st century maritime silk road. This demonstrated the mutual benefits which ASEAN countries can enjoy by becoming regional hubs of the development. These measures and initiatives are evidence of China's efforts and good faith in seeking further and deeper maritime cooperation with its neighbors. And all these measures have been welcomed <coughs> by the neighboring countries. The four said five commitment constitute China's position on the South China Sea. They demonstrate China's sincerity for solving the issues, for securing regional peace and stability, for promoting common development in China's neighborhood. Recently, a number of hot issues have cropped up with regard to the South China Sea. So I'd like to share my views on some of these issues. The first one is about arbitration. The reference to permanent court of arbitration was unilaterally initiated by the Philippines. Many media reports are creating mis a misunderstanding by, explain, by not explaining clearly this circumstances of arbitration. A crucial point is that this is not a court of law. The PCA itself states that PCA is not a court in the traditional sense, but a permanent framework for arbitral tribunals. For any arbitration to work, it requires the proactive participation and agreement of both sides. Another critical point is that China rejects to participate in arbitration at the PCA. From the, very from the very start of the reference from Philippines for arbitration, China made it clear it was not acceptable. It's, it was not an acceptable way to resolve the dispute. Some media and Western politicians are now ramping up this topic of arbitration. They are er erroneously making these claims. If China does not accept the ruling of arbitration panel, it will be breaking international law. It will be seen as violating international law and undermining the rule-based international system. This is completely wrong. China's rejection of arbitration and non-participation in arbitral process is an act of exercising its legitimate rights, empowered by international law. In contrast, it is the Philippines who is challenging the legal and moral bottom, moral bottom line of international community because arbitration is totally unreasonable, unfair, and illegal. I call it arbitration is unreasonable, it is not reasonable because the Philippines went against its commitment to China and other ASEAN countries. Let me briefly summarize the logic of this point. China and the Philippines reached a number of bilateral agreements long ago on, res on resolving disputes through bilateral negotiations. In a declaration of contact reached between China and the Philippines and other ASEAN countries, it is clearly stimulated 
the parties concerned undertake to resolve their territorial and judicial <coughs> dispute by peaceful means. In 2011, Philippines issued a joint statement with China to reaffirm its commitment to negotiations and consultations. However, one year later, it sadly went back on its clear written commitment without notifying China or even asking consent from China. The Philippines initiated arbitration against China unilaterally. Pacta Sant Savonda, in English it means promise must be kept, is a basic rule in international relations. This is a bottom line of morality that every country must strictly observe. To put it simply, the Philippines has reneged on its word and the deeds. Another point is the arbitration is unfair. It's unfair because the islands in arbitration case are the sovereignty property of China since ancient times. What the Philippines is doing is robbing its neighbor than asking the court to rule in his favor over the ownership of the booty. No one in the world should find this reasonable. Here in Britain, there's always an emphasis on rule-based international system. But even rules can be abused, as they are in the Philippine arbitration, what should we expect from such rules and order? An arbitration is illegal for three apparent reasons. First, UNCLOS stimulates that states' parties have the right to settle dispute by any peaceful means of their own choice. The aforementioned arbitration was unilaterally forced ahead by Philippines, who did not seek consent from China. This violates China's legitimate right under international law. Second, UNCLOS also states if state parties have agreed to seek settlement of the dispute by peaceful means of their own choice, the arbitration procedures apply only when no settlement has been reached by recourse to such means. An agreement between the parties does not include any further procedures. China has always been open to bilateral means and clearly bilateral means between China and Philippines has not been exhausted. Third, the clause states, when a dispute arises between state parties concerning interpretation or application of this convention, the parties to dispute should proceed expeditiously to an exchange of views regarding settlement of negotiations or other peaceful means. However, the Philippines have never had any consultations with China. Its unilateral initiation of the arbitration is overt violation of law. It should be also noted for the record that both China and Philippines signed the rectified and the rectified UNCLOS. Compared with what the Philippines did, China has truly implemented and championed the international law. With the PCA, the 14th, the 15th, Submissions made by Philippines concerning territorial sovereignty and maritime delimitation, the UNCLOS have no juris jurisdiction over issues related to sovereignty. As for maritime, maritime delimitation, China made a declaration in 2000, 2006 in accordance with Article 298 of the UNCLOS. This has made very clear that China would exclude disputes on maritime delimitation from compulsory arbitration. So China has exercised its legitimate rights conferred by the UNCLOS, and China's action complies with international law. It should be also noted that over 30 other countries, including the UK, have made a similar declaration based on the same principle of exclusion. These declarations have constituted an inseparable part of the UNCLOS. The reasonable and legitimate appeals and concerns of this country should be considered. 
the Philippines arbitration case become a convention to be followed, then any of these 30 countries should be dragged into arbitration without prior notice. This would be a serious damage to state sovereignty, international order, and the dignity and authority of international law. There has been speculation in the media that PC might soon make public its report on so-called arbitration triggered by the Philippines. China is not hiding away from any outcome. China has been totally consistent in its respect for international law. What China refuses to do is participate, accept, recognize, and implement any arbitration that has no legitimacy in upholding international law. PCA is running at risk of undermining its authority and the legitimacy. The PCA has created a situation where arbitration is clearly unreasonable, unfair, and illegal. Despite this, PCA has still chosen, has chosen to proceed with arbitration with only the Philippines participating. This raises grave concern about PC impartiality and legitimacy. It has, it has also called into question political attention behind arbitration. The arbitration is in essence a political initiative under the cloak of law. China will never accept the result, whatever comes from the PCA. Although China rejects arbitration, the door to bilateral negotiations remains open. China and Philippines are close neighbors. The Chinese and the Fili Chinese and Philippine peoples have long traditional friendship. The Philippines have just elected a new president. We hope that the new Philippine government will work with China on a proper settlement of the differences and bring the situation in South China Sea back on track, following the principles established by UNCLOS and international law. The other issue I want to talk about is the development of China's islands in the South China Sea. Development of some of the Nansha Islands began a few, years, a few years ago. The building efforts will improve the living conditions on the islands and will serve mainly civilian purpose. This includes providing necessary emergency public services to China and also other countries in and from outside the region. The facilities built include lighthouses, lighthouses, maritime communication facilities, search and rescue facilities, medical centers. They will enable China to better fulfill its international responsibility and obligations, such as maritime search, rescue, disaster prevention and relief, maritime scientific research, meteorological observation, eco-environmental protection, navigation safety, and fishing services. There are also some necessary defense facilities deployed according to China's security assessment. Such a deployment on China's island falls within the right of self-protection that every sovereign state is entitled to under the international law. Again, in January this year, according to Reuters news agency, it stated that some shapers believe a greater China's presence could actually improve the safety. Reuters report quoted ship owners saying, if China is to base search and rescue assets on the islands, then there will be potentially be faster response times, improving the chances of rescue and survival. Earlier, I described the crucial importance of international tree of a safe and free of navigation for ships through South China Sea. Responsible observers will then applaud China's investment and actions to make this crucial international artery safer. However, 
Some people complained about scale and speed of building efforts. I want to remind these people that the scale, speed are not a benchmark for right or wrong. The scale, speed of China's building efforts match China's international responsibility in the South China Sea. Why would China sit on its hands and refrain from doing the right things simply because of its size? Some others accuse China of changing the status quo. I'd like to ask this question. What is the status quo? China's construction takes place on its own island. China is not changing any status quo. And also, I'd like to ask those who are keen on not changing status quo, why they are silent when some countries illegally occupy China's island and want in for large-scale construction activities there. The third hot issue is the so-called military militarization of the South China Sea. Recently, the militarization has been hyped up and the United States shouts the loudest. However, it is not difficult to see who is the military rising the South China Sea. More than half of the U.S. military force is deployed in Asia Pacific. Yet this is a region that has been largely peaceful and stable for many years. In addition to this huge military force, the United States, together with its allies in the region, frequently flexes its military muscles. This is shown with the conduct of highly targeted military drills then there are military jets and warships on closing reconnaissance in nearby waters and airspace of China's islands and reefs. It is this prerogative and hostile actions that have raised the tension in the South China Sea. And these acts have also sent wrong signals to Philippines and others who have recklessly deployed military facilities <coughs> on their illegally occupied islands. The answer to the question, who is military, military, militarizing the South China Sea, is nothing but the self-evidence. Going forward, it is the hope of China that the United States will act as a big country with responsibility, be prudent in what it says and does on, on this complicated issue, commit to and respect widely agreed international law, such as UNCLOS, and work with China to safeguard stability and peace in the region. Therefore, to, military, to solve the militarization issue, the United States needs to first of all stop its dangerous provocations that challenge China's sovereignty and security. Secondly, stop being prerogative with its military, militarization, and thirdly, take concrete steps to facilitate peace and stability in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, the complicated and sensitive as South China Sea issue is, the region has maintained overall stability thanks to the joint efforts of China and its neighbors. China will, as it grows in strength, make a greater contribution to the stability and prosperity of the South China Sea. As President Xi Jinping once said, China is building maritime power through peace, development, and win-win cooperation. What China has achieved today can be largely attributed to its path of peaceful development, and China will keep to this path. Looking into the future, China is confident and capable of resolving disputes through negotiations and consultations. China has shown a constant commitment to upholding international law. China has been continuous in safeguarding peace, stability in the South China Sea through cooperation. China is ready to join hands with other countries to create peaceful resolution, and China can always be counted on to build the South China Sea into a sea of peace, sea of friendship, and a sea of cooperation. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Ambassador, thank you very much uh, for that very detailed uh, presentation. We now have uh, some 15 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, I would ask you, please, when I catch your eye, uh, to, to tell us who you are. Uh, if you think I should recognize you, but don't, please don't be offended. All I will be able to see is actually a hand. So um, we'll start with the, the gentleman in the front row here, please. Should I answer? Thank you, Nigel. John Ellison, I'm a member uh, of the IISS. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, I wonder if you could just clarify one point. You've said that the United States warships transiting near the islands were illegal. Is this not covered by the right of innocent passage set out in UNCLOS, which does say a warship can go through other people's territorial waters provided certain conditions are maintained? Uh, I think this. Uh, I think the United States have abused this uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, innocent passage. Uh, they did not show the respect for China's sovereignty. They did not notify China first of all, and they didn't seek to get the permission from China. So that is uh, totally uh, against it, the international practice. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, gentleman in the second row there, I think. Um, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, name is Mahmoud Ali. Uh, I'm a student of U.S.-China relations. Uh, thank you for sharing your insights, uh, Ambassador. Towards the end of your presentation, you hinted at um, the tension between the United States and, and China, which seemed to be roiling this particular dispute much more than uh, it otherwise would have been. If it's just between Vietnam and China, the Philippines and the China, things could perhaps have been managed. But at the systemic level, as you can see, the United States is the system manager, wishes to maintain the status quo. And China has been described for over a decade now in semi-official US military documentation as a near peer rival. So it is fundamentally about managing relations between or tensions between China and the United States. What is China doing to make sure the transition to whatever the future holds is peaceful and stable and calm and quiet? Thank you. Okay. Uh, as I said in my, ta in my presentation, that uh, from the very beginning, uh, China is not troublemaker. Instead, China is a victim in all this. Uh, I hope I made myself clear. You know, because before this so-called uh, rebalancing strategy by the United States, the uh, uh, South China Sea and the region has been very peaceful. And uh, the neighboring countries, including Philippines and Vietnam, they are talking. We are talking to each other, and we have this uh, declaration of uh, conduct, and we have managed our differences uh, effectively. This dispute has been there for 30 years. The area has been quite stable. But when it comes to U.S. so-called rebalancing strategy in 2009, I think some countries you know, uh, they got emboldened. I think they thought they have the United States behind them. Philippines changed their approach. They submit a so-called uh, baseline. And Vietnamese also changed their approach. And Philippines re reject to talk to us. And then they unilaterally put in this so-called arbitration. You know, there are many ways to resolve disputes. Arbitration, according to UNCLOS, is only supplementary. The main method for resolving dispute is a peaceful negotiations, consultations between member states. Yet Philippines resort to the, some so-called supplementary measures, which is not the main cause, and, and I think they thought they had the support of the United States. Um, I think China and want to have a good relations with the United States. There's no doubt about that. Half of my career has been devoted to a better relations between China and the U.S. I've been posted twice in Washington. Uh, you know, we want to have a good relation. We also know that without good relation between China and the United States, there will be no peace, no prosperity between, uh, in, in, in Asia Pacific. So we tried very hard, and we tried to engage them in consultations. I'm very pleased to see that currently the security consultations is right now taking place in Washington. Um, 
you know, the, uh, the Deputy uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs is uh, talking to uh, U.S. Deputy Secretary. So we do have uh, these uh, uh, channels, I think. Uh, but the important thing, Americans should change from the basic mindset to regard China as a threat. I, I think that's the problem they have. They've been haunted that China will be someday will take their place as a leader of the world. That is not China's dream. You know, China's dream to re, uh, revitalize Chinese nation. We know what we are doing, and we know the tremendous challenges ahead of us. We have a 1.3 billion people to take care of. You know, I've been, after Egypt, been seconded to uh, one of the poorest provinces in Gansu as an assistant governor. I know how poor that area is. I know there's a challenge, tremendous task for China to achieve its modernization. We will be the last country who want to have a bad relation with the United States. We're not interested in being a superpower. I know UK has been a superpower. When I know the superpower, you will take a lot of responsibilities. And we have enough responsibility to take care of our own people. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, a lady at the back there, please. Did you, madam, did you want to ask a question? No? Okay. Then, um, yes, we're coming down to the third <coughs> row, please, here. Ambassador, um, <coughs> Rima Kamari Jadeja, a member of the Institute. I would just like your thoughts on the recent incident where the Pentagon has gone on record yesterday saying that China uh, made an unsafe <coughs> intercept, um, two Chinese J-11s made an unsafe intercept of an EP-3 reconnaissance aircraft. Is, in your opinion, is this uh, U.S. antagonization? Uh, I think it's dangerous move on U.S. part. You know, um, one, I think Americans uh, now try to challenge China's sovereignty on these reefs. That is a very dangerous move. Uh, they do it on the so-called uh, uh, cloak of so-called uh, freedom of navigation. We know the ocean is, is widely enough to have their vessels uh, have a free passage, but they want to do this uh, closing reconnaissance. They want to challenge uh, China's defense. So this is a very dangerous move. Uh, but the, um, the case you are talk, you mentioned, in fact, has been reputed by the Chinese uh, spokesman of uh, Chi Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, in fact, the Chinese, you know, has every reason to defend uh, its sovereignty. Uh, and so uh, there are some Chinese Air Force uh, airplanes uh, you know, want to find out what Americans are trying to do. But they did it in a very professional way. And uh, they, 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 they conducted in the uh, uh, safety uh, a boundary. And uh, there's no doubt about it. We try um, to avoid any uh, you know, um, unexpected things happen, uh, especially the conflict. But I, I, if Americans keep doing this, uh, I think they are walking into a very dangerous waters. Thank you. Okay, the gentleman right at the back there standing. Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Brister. I'm from the BBC. Um, Ambassador, um, you've spoken, uh, criticized the permanent course of arbitration in The Hague. I've heard Chinese officials do that before, but I can't remember one saying that they wouldn't accept the result. Now, can you just confirm that that is what you're saying, that you're not going to accept the result of or the rulings of this court, regardless of what they are? And on a related question, um, you seem to be linking the permanent court of arbitration's rulings with sovereignty. It's my understanding it's got nothing to do with sovereignty. They're merely uh, going to rule on the status of reefs, islands, rocks, islets in the South China Sea. Now, you've already said that China has been planting and fishing on those, those areas for many centuries. Why is it that you reject that narrow definition of what they're looking at? Because surely that would help your case. And if you're as certain as you seem to be that you're in the right, why, why would you not accept their... Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Uh, to answer your first question, as I said, this uh, 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 tribunal from the very start, the reference of this uh, arbitration tribunal, is illegal. 
So how could you expect the illegal tribunal could, uh, uh, you know, uh, result in a good case? So uh, we have no obligation at all from the very beginning. We think the tribunal itself is a violation of UNCLOS and international law. Now comes to the some uh, uh, differences. So the pe when, when you we, we are not obligated at all by this arbitration because it's a, uh, so I would say in a very clear cut term, no matter what decision this arbitration uh, is going to make, it will make no difference on China's sovereignty over this island and no binding at all on China uh, because it's illegal, unfair, and reasonable, I have already said clearly in my presentation. With regard to what, uh, the arbitration is going to uh, make uh, you know, a decision on. I already give you an example. You know, when some people rob you, you know, they got the bullets from this uh, robbery, and then they put it in the court, ask the judge to make decision about you know, whatever, whether it's ownership, why it's a, this bullet is in good conditions, or this uh, is a, whatever. That itself, you know, if a judge handles this case, it has an impact on the ownership, on the sovereignty. So, though the you know, Philippines, they try to uh, uh, decorate it, this case. Uh, they wrap up uh, with the cloak of law. You know, the first submitted, I think, 15 submissions. I think eight has been rejected because the, even the they asked uh, the tribunals are uh, concerned about uh, getting involved uh, in this uh, dispute. That, that's uh, too obvious for them to violate the UNCLOS. So they changed some techniques, but I think it doesn't change the essence of this case. So from the very beginning, this case is uh, about the sovereignty, it's about uh, you know, uh, delimit de delimitation, it's beyond the authority and, uh, and the jurisdiction of arbitration, even by UNCLOS. So itself, the establishment of this arbitration itself is a violation of UNCLOS. So China is fighting this case according to internal law, fighting this case in order to protect the international law. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we have room for just one more question, so I'll take the gentleman in the second row there, please. And could, you, could I please ask you to be brief, because we're very close to being out of time. Thank you. Uh, my name is Danny Kwan. I'm from the London School of Economics. I'd like to ask your view on the U.S. economic narrative in the South China Sea, where you think it stands now. On the security side, Ashton Carter and others have, of course, been very proactive in escalating their rhetoric. But on the economic side, America's narrative here had been TPP, but that now stands in jeopardy. Whether it will be ratified either before or after the new presidency is very much up in the air. China's successful narrative in Southeast Asia had been primarily economic. Do you see that this means that the change in the presidency works to China's continuing successful conversation with Southeast Asia? Uh, of course, we watch American uh, presidential election very closely with a great interest. Uh, but of course, uh, you cannot predict. Uh, I do not know, no one in this room can predict the outcome of this election. But I would say we are ready to deal with any, whoever, will be elected by American people. Uh, I think whoever, uh, you know, uh, d despite all their rhetorics, and I've been, as I told you, I've been working on China-U.S. affairs for more than 20 years and been through several elections. Uh, I understand their election politics. Uh, we put more emphasis on what they are doing after election. Uh, I think, uh, I hope that the new administration will set store the overall interest uh, of China-U.S. relations, and we are ready to work with whoever the new host and new occupants in the Oval Office in Washington.
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid we have run out of time, so I'm going to have to draw a halt to proceedings here. I'd just like to uh, make one brief observation, which is that we find in IISS now that the strategic salience of, of China is such that it's taking up an increasing amount of our time. I think we concluded recently that one in every three of our Adelphi books uh, has uh, China as a topic, which I think tells you something. And if you'll permit me a brief moment of shameless uh, product placement, the next uh, Adelphi book we're about to launch is one written by me on the subject of uh, China's cyber power to be launched uh, sometime uh, in mid-June. So uh, watch this space. But um, uh, I'd like uh, all, all of you to join me in thanking Ambassador Liu for a very detailed and full presentation. Thank you.